Hey guys, this is Sakhbar from Lemon Press, and uh, today we actually have a very special guest from Hong Kong, uh, Tom Holland, who is a, a co-founder and managing partner at Development Finance Asia. It's a boutique investment group based in Hong Kong. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. How are you? Good. It's great to be back in Mongolia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So before we actually go into Development Finance Asia's work, uh, this is your first time here in Mongolia since the COVID outbreak. That's right. That's right. How much has changed? Um, well, I would say mainly the traffic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so seems like selling cars has been a good business. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, well, I think everyone in the world's been uh, having a bit of a hangover from this pandemic. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, the big things that stand out to me, aside from the traffic, is, um, you know, the issues that they're having with the U.S. dollar liquidity. You know, as a foreign investor, that's really important. Um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, that's, that's really uh, something that stands out a lot to me. Um, aside from that, um, no, I think, I think the, the country's been very resilient. I know it's been it's taken some knocks and there's challenges with the borders, um, but I think um, the future is is bright and it's things are starting to normalize again. Feels like, fingers crossed. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's um, aside from that, you know, everyone's just got a little less hair and a little bit uh, more on the waist. That's all. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, that uh, that sounds good actually. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so. Um, like I've said, uh, Tom is the co-founder and managing partner at uh, DFA, Development Finance Asia. So could you tell us a bit more about what DFA does? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so DFA was born out of a group called Cube Capital. And um, Cube is how I got involved with Mongolia in the first place. Um, so started coming here and doing business here in 2009. Um, and so Cube was an asset manager. We were running funds. Um, and working across the capital structure across Asia. Um, and DFA spun out of Cube effectively um, and continued to focus on emerging markets. Uh, at Cube, we were also doing trading. We were doing a lot in China, doing non-performing loans, a lot of private lending. Um, and so we continued on with some of that work. Um, so you know, we, we did a bit of private lending, working with funds in Hong Kong. Um, we did some venture building. So, for instance, we started the largest non-bank finance institution in Myanmar and have built that up over the years. Um, we developed some real estate in Vietnam and uh, working with some development banks here with some, some assets that were, I'd call them good companies, bad balance sheet or situations where um, someone needed to, to get some liquidity um, and often working with a development bank. Um, that's how we've worked in Mongolia. And in the recent past, we've been getting much more involved with uh, sustainable finance. So we're doing reforestation projects in Myanmar, um, working with community forest programs in Cambodia, um, getting involved with um, digital traceability for sustainable su like supply chains for food um, with smallholder farmers in Indonesia. And um, yeah, just coming, coming back to Mongolia for the first time from, since the pandemic and um, excited to do more here in Mongolia. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned about emerging markets, and I want to clarify that for our viewers. Mm -hmm. um, some of them might be professionals, and some of them are just sure. financials who are who want to understand more. Sure. So development finance focuses on uh, inefficient markets with long-term growth potential. Mm. What does it mean? Yeah, look, I mean, I think ultimately, if you are a capital group or a capital provider, um, your job is to provide capital where there is a shortage of it. Um, and so that can be uh, any type of dislocation. It could be a macro dislocation. Uh, it could be a um, distress situation. It could be a very high growth um, situation like a venture, venture build type of investment. Um, so generally speaking, you know, we're, our investors don't come to us for what they call beta which is just taking a market risk, um, which I think is suitable for private investors. You know, if you're investing your own money, um, you know, I think it's prudent to buy, you know, index and <laughs> you'll, you'll beat most of the fund managers that way. Uh, but I think if you're um, trying to add value as a, as a capital manager or someone that's managing money for other people, um, you're really looking, I mean, at the core of it, you know, it's um, where there's a shortage of capital where there shouldn't be. 
Okay, so uh, can I name that impact investing? Well, impact investing is, I think that has a very special meaning. Um, I think um, impact these days is very strictly defined. And, and if you sort of stray from that mandate, you, you can be accused of what's called as greenwashing, which is, you know, quite, you know it's, it basically means that you're pretending to be an impact investor when you're not. Um, so if you're being really true to impact investing, it means you're investing with intentionality to uh, make some positive changes, you know, let's say along the lines of, you know, environment, social or governance. And you're actually coming up with fairly strict metrics to measure the performance of the investment against that, you know, and, and if I want to overgeneralize, they can call it triple bottom line. So, you know, you're delivering profits, profits and, you know, social and environmental good. Um, and you have to measure this. So I think, you know, I, I find that um, through the pandemic and investing in the markets that we're in, you know, there's a lot going on. So I find it's difficult to be to strictly fit in that category of impact investing because we have enough other, you know, four letter word, <laughs> bad word to deal with. OK, um, so, you know, and, and I think, you know, a good example of that is just take the currency. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and um, you know, you take the what the Mongolian Tugruk has done um, over the past, you know, two or three years. And, you know, for a foreign investor, that's quite painful. Right. So we so I think when we're when we talk about sustainable finance or sustainable investing, um, I would say it's a bit broad, more broad than impact investing. And sorry, I'm being very strict with definition here. Yeah. yeah. And um, so so that that's more like, um, you know, we pick a handful of metrics where we're trying to do some social good or um, in some cases, it's very clear cut, you know, and I think that would be like a reforestation project or a renewable project. In some cases, it's not so clear cut. So it might be helping um, a building that's polluting become more efficient, but it's still polluting, right? So, but, but that's, um, that's important, you know, in, this, in what they call transition finance, that's still important, yeah. Uh, so I'm pretty sure our viewers are wondering by now, uh, what does the track record uh, look like at uh, Development Finance Asia in Mongolian market? Also, mm -hmm. maybe if you want to go into some of the interesting projects that are happening that you are involved with outside of Mongolia. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, broadly speaking, um, we've generated just over a 20% annualized return. Right. Um, I think in Mongolia, it's been similar. That being said, the risks or the, let's say the, our portfolio, our current portfolios that have ridden through the pandemic, um, I think it's going to, you know, time will tell, right? right? Because, and I think a lot depends on what happens with the macro situation. Right. If things really deteriorate, you know, if um, there's a fuel shortage or, you know, obviously the, the current investments will do worse than that. Otherwise, I would expect to continue to track um, that type of performance. Um, I think in, in Mongolia, our, um, you know, our investments, we, we have positions in um, logistics, um, you know, some stocks like um, Mandal and APU. And, um, you know, we, we have some real estate exposure. Um, and then in terms of other parts, uh, other things that we're doing, um, I think one of the projects that we're working on now um, that I think is quite interesting is trying to build a nature-based solutions incubator. So this is really focused on developing um, projects where um, nature can deliver, nature solutions for the, for the environment um, can deliver commercial returns. And that really means working with carbon offset markets. So you're, you're basically what you're, is you're, you're creating, let's say if, as an example, um, you're helping a community reforest uh, part of their land that was degraded. Um, you use certain types of trees to, to fix that, you know, to get the soil ready for the forest to be planted. That timber gets harvested for the forest, um, you know, the, the timber that prepared the soil, and that has a commercial value. So that can go to the investors, and then carbon markets can go, a carbon market program can go to the consumer, mm. as an example. Right. right. Um, so I think that's one theme that we're interested in. If you're about globally speaking or across Asia, it's um, I think 
the climate crisis is real, and I think it's time for urgent action, and I think carbon markets are going to feature more prominently. And, and I think in Mongolia, that, creates, that will also create some opportunities. Um, you know, renewable energy creates some of those opportunities, but also um, Mongolia has ob obviously uh, amazing grassland resources that sequester carbon, um, and uh, peat, which, um, which actually sequesters a lot of carbon. Um, so I think this is something that, um, something that I hope Mongolia puts a lot of focus on because it's, it's a real natural asset for the country as well. Right. Uh, so you mentioned about, uh, I want to go in, um, into your portfolio at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about Mondo, APU. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other companies uh, in your portfolio so far in, Mo in Mongolia? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, look, we're involved with um, logistics company. And, and then um, in terms of the uh, companies that we like on the exchange, um, I think we, we consider APU to be, you know, the real blue chip of Mongolia, mm -hmm. the blue chip stock. Um, it's an incredibly well-run company. Um, you have Heineken um, involved, sitting on the board, helping with the supply chain. Um, very steady results, great brands. You know, it sort of has the Warren Buffett. <laughs> it's sort of ticking all the Warren Buffett boxes. Um, an incredibly steady cash flow and dividend. Um, and I think if you look at the fundamentals, there's very little leverage in the company. Um, so it can really withstand a tough cycle. Um, which I would say were three quarters of the way through. And um, at the same time, has growth potential. It's showing some real promise with its exports, um, getting you know Golden Gobi into uh, GS25 stores across Korea. I think this is fantastic. You know, Mongolian, Mongolia has a great brand and uh, needs to get it out more. So it's great to see uh, product going, going mass market in places like Korea. And so I think a a APU's, uh, you know, an excellent platform from that standpoint. And then if you're just looking at it from a valuation standpoint, I think this is a, um, if you're looking at, let's, let's say at a EV to EBITDA type of um, valuation, which is basically just saying, if you look at its cash flow relative to its total assets, um, compared to what similar companies are valued at around the world, it's about one third, right? So I'm not saying the stock will go up three times, but I'm saying it's very cheap. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that that's, uh, that's very mispriced by the market. And you asked earlier about inefficient markets. Right. And I think, you know, a, a stock market like the MSE, where you tend to have low free floats, um, people tend to have governance concerns and, and so forth, and uh, not a lot of liquidity, you know, that brings inefficiency. And sometimes that means being extremely overvalued or extremely undervalued. You know, so in that case, I find it's it's pretty undervalued, you know. Um, so that that's um, that's an example where I think it's, um, you know, I, I, I hope more companies turn out like APU where they're this type of management and, um, you know, kind of world class company. Yeah. Right. Um, and then you have smaller companies like Mandal. And um, I just think it has a great management team. And um, if you think there's a risk of a rising interest rate cycle. Um, you know, I think uh, insurance is often a great hedge um, because, you know, they're, they have two businesses. One is underwriting and selling policies, and the other one is managing that money uh, before the claims, right, where the claims get pulled out of. So if that pool of funds um, that's getting managed to pay out claims um, can generate much higher interest rates um, in safe investments like bank deposits, um, you know, there's, that's, that's great for the company. And I think also they're, you know, they're consolidating market share. And, uh, you know, I think that I think that's very interesting. Right. Uh, and then, you know, the logistics theme, um, I think we all know um, the real driver for Mongol the Mongolian economy is, uh, you know, moving commodities to China. Right. And uh, so it's it's the, the folks that are bringing the valuable stuff out of the earth. And it's the and then it's it has to get to China. Right. And I think. Um, and I think that's the real key for the macro story in Mongolia. I think we all know there's been challenges at the borders uh, with, the, with the pandemic and the, the policies that China's had. Um, and, you know, it's taken a long time to get railways in and, um, you know, smoothing out logistics. And, you know, I still think there's a lot more that can be done to help Mongolia with these logistics. 
but I, I would say, you know, if you're if you're sort of trying to judge like how the what what the government's really achieving for for the economy long term, you know, logistics is really important. What's happening at the logistics and the borders is really critical, you know, and that's really going to underpin, you know, macro macroeconomic stability for the country. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think uh, we're actually getting into uh, the current situation mm-hmm. of the country itself, Mongolia, mm-hmm. and overall the entire uh, world. <laughs> so uh, we all know at this point, the economy is not doing very well, mm-hmm. both in Mongolia and uh, internationally. And next year, um, next year the outlook is also not so great. Mm-hmm. So. What's your opinion on, on that right now? Well, look, I don't think we should be so hard on ourselves. Yeah. I think we've all been through uh, a bit of pandemic madness. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, it's tough for Mongolia because, um, you know, it, from a population standpoint, an economy size standpoint, it's, you know, it's a small country and it has to deal with what other countries around it are doing. Um, and so I think um, you, you can only have focus on controlling what you can control. So, but that being said, this is a very unique time in terms of markets and finance and economics um, across the board. I mean, you've had a, a pandemic that people shut the world down for, and you've had Western central banks stimulate excessively, and you've had um, you know countries like Mongolia also extending their budgets probably too much to get through the cycle, and um, that's creating a lot of. I'd call it a hangover. You know, it's creating a big hangover for um, markets. Um, and trying to understand inf- what, what the inflationary impact is. And, and now we're seeing Western central banks uh, reacting perhaps late. And, re- and we've had one of the biggest, sharpest um, increases in interest rates, you know, in the history of interest rates. You know, for if you're look, looking at the short end of the U.S., you know, you've gone from under a percent to around 4% in a very short period of time. Um, and this just destroys asset prices. You know, the way you discount future earnings to value a stock or, or uh, property income, uh, cap, you know, it means cap rates have to back up. And, you know, very simply from, from an investor standpoint, you know, if I can buy a government bond that's going to pay me 4%, 5%, you know, why, you know, that means I have to get a higher return if I'm going to do something riskier. So that, that's, caused, that's caused everything to reprice greatly. And of course, this has knock-on impacts on, you know, banks and crypto and everything else. Um, so I think, you know, I think Mongolia is in a, it's in a tricky spot, right? And I think the key is it should have been a beneficiary of the inflation um, with its commodity-driven economy. Um, but it's had to deal with zero COVID policies, you know, from its neighbor in the South. Yes. And um, so, so that's, I think that's why you're seeing what people are calling a liquidity squeeze here and why you're having these dollar shortage issues. And I think why the, the most immediate priority for Mongolia should be to get the borders open and the commodities flowing and the money flowing back. And I know there's barter that needs to be worked through and, uh, but I think that's that's going to be the key. And and I think, but at the same time, you know, you're seeing phase two of OT getting developed. You've seen some railways getting, you know, put in place. So I think, you know, from an investor standpoint, uh, provided things can hold together uh, and there's no fuel shortage and China keeps slowly opening up, uh, I think the position of Mongolia can improve quite rapidly. Um, so I think, you know, that, that's something and it, something that can change very quickly here. Small economy it does not take a lot to, you know, really, you know, flip to a, a really positive economy or market situation. And I think uh, anyone who's followed markets in Mongolia for the past decade, you know, has seen this before. Right. I mean, they've seen the sharp uptick in, you know, 09 through 2011. They've seen it dip down 2013, 14, yeah. then the tough years, yeah. and then a little glimmers of hope here and there. And, uh, you know, here we are. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, um, thank you for being so hopeful, uh, mm-hmm. Tom, actually. So listen to you, uh, hearing you speak uh, on Mongolia. Uh, 
I think we're, we're making progress, mm -hmm. definitely. So that's why Lemon Press actually covers, uh, tries to cover the capital market as uh, best as we can mm -hmm. uh, for both uh, domestic uh, professionals, mm -hmm. for, for also foreign investors through Inside Mongolia, our English uh, language-based newsletter. So uh, moving forward, I, um, I want to get into uh, our domestic market more mm -hmm. in a sense that uh, development finance Asia is active in a lot of uh, Asian countries, mm -hmm. not just Mongolia, like you said. So what's the difference, you would say, between, let's say, Southeast Asian countries and Mongolia for from foreign investor perspective? And let's say in the future, uh, some investor uh, is interested in Mongolian market and watching us. So what you, sure. would you say that the, the, the really the big differences? Yeah, well, aside from it being a lot colder here, and uh, I think, I think um, you know, like I think the lens, a good way to look at Asia is you have um, two different types of countries. Um, you have countries that were, let's call them post-colonial, um, and then you have transition economies. So often a state economy that's transitioned to some form of market economy. Um, and so I think it's better to group companies like that, right? Because then in many ways, uh, aside from population and, you know, uh, what companies, what countries' um, economic advantages are, um, you know, sort of how they look and feel, like from an institutional standpoint, really comes down to that, right? So, and oftentimes what you find in post-colonial countries, um, you know, where you've had, um, you know, talk about like Indonesia, um, you know, where you've had, uh, or Philippines, where you've had a colonial power leave, and oftentimes they left the keys to the economy to small groups of families. You know, it's uh, it's got one certain flavor. You know, where it's um, a very family type of run, um, and then you have transition economies where you have, um, you know, I'd say, and then you take a country like Vietnam and a country like uh, Mongolia. You know, where you've had a, a certain, you know, you've gone from a centralized planned economy, uh, and you've nationalized institutions. Uh, and they've been, you know, smart, opportunistic individuals that have taken advantage of that national, you know, or I shouldn't say nationalization process, of that, um, you know, liberalization process or, um, you know, sort of privatization process privatization is the right process, word. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that th they become sort of the champions of industry and often in the form of an oligarch. Right. And I think um, and, you know, a lot of, you know, and, and the markets are similar, right, because the, the transition took place you know, similar time, you know, Berlin Wall went down and transition started. And so, you know, we're sort of at the late innings of that first generation. And, um, you know, they're the oligarchs and they run the economy um, and oftentimes the government. And so that that has another feel to it. Right. I mean, I think in the the colonial economies, you know, you've had you have the local families that run the economy. Um, oftentimes they're Chinese and the politics is run by the local ethnic groups whereas mongolia you don't have that you know it's uh you know one group of people i mean i know you have uh, that's that's an overgeneralization, but it's not like uh, myanmar where you have you know 65 very different ethnic groups um, that were smashed together by some colonial power and they're fighting it out all the time you know mongolians do have you know a certain degree of national pride and you know it's, it's culturally Unity. sound Right. You know, so I, and, and I think the Vietnamese are similar, right? It's one group of people. I mean, I know it's, you know, again, that's oversimplifying it. Yeah. But again, compared to, you know, it, compared to, say, um, the colonial powers where you have Chinese running the business and the Chinese families running the business and the locals running the politics. And that's sort of the, the deal. Uh, that's sort of the unwritten rule because the Chinese will never go into politics. So the politicians trust them with the assets. That's kind of the way it works. So, yeah, so I would say, you know, you're starting starting with that. Those are two frames with which to view um, diff, like the groups of countries in Asia. And then, you know, obviously from there, you know, when you're, you know, investors always like large populations. Um, so Mongolia is a bit of a <laughs> it's a bit different. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think what's exciting about Mongolia is it's always had that it's in a way I, I hate to call it an option trade, but option trades just mean that. Um, you have a huge upside, uh, and Mongolia, with its resources, has a huge upside. Mm. You know, 
and 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 a and a base that's um you know I think there can be a tremendous growth from. Um, so that's what makes this market exciting, and it's quite different. Like no other market has that potential, right? Uh, at the same time, it's a resource market, so it has similarities similarities to other resource markets, um, which is like a blessing and a curse sometimes, um, yeah, because it's hard to get past. But I would say people in power feeling like this is a zero sum game, uh, and when you have that dynamic, it's hard for the country to really progress, right? And then just people fighting over control of resource and. And, and that, that's what they view as, and, and then that, that just holds the con- country back, as opposed to, you know, why isn't the Gare District redeveloped? Should have been done 15 years ago. Or why is there no renewable power? You know, I think a lot of that can be put down to the resource curse, ultimately. Um, so that has similarities with other countries. And I think, you know, one difficult challenge Mongolia has, uh, I mean, it's pretty unique in that it's between these two, you know, colossal neighbors right. and it's landlocked. And that, that's a huge challenge. I mean, when you were landlocked, I mean, you can see it with the pricing um, that Mongolia gets for its commodities from China. You know, it's hard to negotiate, you know, and um, that's always a challenge. Uh, but still, I think, um, you know, I still think there's a, there's a very bright future. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Tom, actually, I want to get into, uh, you talked about... Uh, the potential Mongolia has, mm. and aside, uh, well, you you've said Apu is really the one of the blue chip, chip. Mm-hmm. maybe the perhaps the only chip blue mm. chip mm-hmm. stock of Mongolia. Uh, what do you think? There are other high quality uh, investment opportunities in Mongolia. Yeah, um, uh, personally, right. I, I think um, I think renewable energy has right. to be. A huge theme here, mm. um, and it's it's frustrating that it's not a bigger theme here, um, considering some of the power bottlenecks and and the sheer I guess potential for it. I mean, Mongolia actually has tremendous wind power potential um, as well as um, solar, and um, it, to the to the extent where it could be an exporter of power uh, eventually uh, to other parts of Asia, and um, to me. Um, You know, when you're looking, when you're walking outside on a winter day here and sometimes you get a breath of that, that nasty air sometimes, you know, it's, you know, it's not, it wouldn't be difficult to bring in a lot of foreign capital to develop renewable capacity. You know, the cost is coming way down. Um, In many cases, it's the cost is lower than, um, you know, thermal power many countries and maybe not here with its abundant thermal coal resources, which I know is an obstacle. Uh, But I think, um, you know, this this should this is a sector that can create a lot of jobs and create a lot of opportunity and growth uh, for Mongolia uh, as you're sort of bridging the growth of these other resources. Uh, And also, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it can diversify away just from, you know, getting resource driven growth. Right. Uh, Right. So um, one thing I also want to get into is uh, uh, you probably noticed the the banks are going public at this year. Sure. Uh, well, actually, they're uh, required to go public mm-hmm. before the end of June mm-hmm. next year. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about Mongolia's uh, capital market has a lot of potential, and of mm. course, it also includes uh, regulation and investment environment and uh, uh, the environment that government creates Mm -hmm. for not only uh, the the Mongolian market itself, but for uh, foreign investors also. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about that? Um, Are you looking at the banks? Uh, If so, uh, which is very interesting for you? Which one is interesting for you at this point? I also want to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, look, I mean, banks are... um you know, they're kind of a unique asset class. Um, I would oversimplify investing in banks as you're investing in a warrant on GDP. You know, in effect, you're kind of just taking a position on GDP growth. Um, it's really hard to analyze. It's really hard to understand what actually is in the loan book. You know, who's been, you know, who's been underwriting properly and who hasn't. Um, so that being said, look, I think where the banks are being priced now 
you know, you're sort of like one point, I guess, post money, you're talking 1.1 times book, let's say for Golden Bank, for example. I don't find that to be extraordinarily challenging um, valuation. That being said, you know, the, you know, in a boom time, that could go to 3x, uh, three times book value. Uh, and, and in a um, challenging environment, let's say if um, you have a fuel shortage or more stress or inflation runs away here or you can't get the sovereign bond, you know, refinanced, um, then you could easily dip below book value. Right. So, um, yeah, that I mean, and, and so, I mean, I think everyone knows the, the quality names and I think um, it's a very well banked uh, country. Um, so I think that that constricts the growth opportunity a little bit, right. you know. But the, but again, with the country's growth potential, um, you know, there's there's opportunity. Uh, but it's more of a, I think it's more of a country bet than a um, company bet. Let's say, yeah, um, that's kind of how I'd view that one. Uh, in terms of the timing, I, I think it's a I think it's a funny time to put the policy in place because it's it removes a lot of liquidity. You know, it mops up a lot of liquidity in an environment where there's not a lot of liquidity, you know, because just because of the borders being shut. And so I find the timing to be a bit strange. Um, and I think one issue in the, you know, Mongolia is you don't really have any, um, I'd call them real investors. You know, we're talking about institutional investors that are continuously buying. Um, and in, in most places, that means, uh, you know, government pension, sovereign wealth fund, pension, insurance companies. And uh, so you have a small insurance sector that's emerging, um, but I wouldn't call it large enough to, you know, the, the amount of money it's putting into stock market is, I would say, negligible. Um, I would hope there's going to be pension reform here. There's been a lot of talk about it. And I think it's really important for the capital market and really important for bringing in foreign investors. And uh, sovereign wealth fund, I really think that's, imp when you're a resource economy, um, you know, your resources are finite in some cases, possibly obsolete. Let's say if you talk about thermal coal, um, you know, it, it's not going to be uh, nice to be a thermal coal, you know, <laughs> supplier or, you know, someone that's burning that stuff for power, you know, increasingly, um, that's going to be looked down upon quite badly. <laughs> so, so I think um, I understand there's probably there's some, some interest to monetize the coal resources as quickly as possible. And personally, I hope that the international community can um, find a way to compensate Mongolia for not, you know, going that direction. Um, because, you know, look, the West, everyone knows developed countries have benefited by burning all their coal. And I can understand the mentality in Mongolia. Why can't we? Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, I think the earth is having a, a real crisis with climate. And so I think um, I think they really have to. Um, you know, find another solution away from coal. But I think, but I actually think Mongolia should be compensated for not, um, you know, digging up its coal to burn for power. So I, I would love to see an international mechanism out of one of these COP meetings uh, for that, for an example. Um, yeah, so that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. And uh, Tom, actually, I want to ask um, what actions or policy uh, can government of Mongolia can take sure. uh, for, for the growth of this, for, for capital market growth. Sure. And sure. Can yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think they should create a sovereign wealth fund. Right. I think um, they should come up with pension reform right. and then providing stable bid into the local capital market mm -hmm. by market professionals mm -hmm. so that companies are getting priced accurately and, and this is like a way, a nicer way of improving governance because those investors, institutional investors, sh you know, should be the ones keeping the management teams in line as opposed to someone just waving their finger at them, saying you're doing this wrong, right? So I think, you know, put in place, you know, proper governance standards, you know, independent boards, you know, and, and but I think the most important thing is to come up with a steady source of local liquidity to make sure that the capital markets here are liquid. Because as a foreign investor, it's really hard to bring capital here because people just say, how are you going to exit? It's not enough liquidity. Right. So that has to be addressed, you know, in any way that makes it 
uh, I guess, easier for, for capital to come in. And I think Mongolia has done a great job generally in the past. There's no capital controls um, officially. <laughs> I think unofficially there's one right now. Um, you know, so and, and I think, um, you know, obviously things like courts, institutions are very important. You know, people have to feel like if they're having a problem, they can go to a court and they can get justice. Um, I think that's a challenge now. Um, so anything that improves rule of law uh, is, is important. You know, having clear, stable tax structure. And then the macro, macro stability. So it's, uh, are you keeping the budget in line? Are you allocating capital properly? You know, are you letting productive assets get developed efficiently? Or are you always meddling, trying to renegotiate a contract with a mine or a power purchase agreement? You know, it's like, I think you have to let investments take root and grow. And if you feel like something was done improperly, then split the pie later when it's producing cash. You know, I think one big mistake that was made here, uh, if you go back to like 2000, uh, you know, eight, nine, that time, there, you know, there was a, there was a mining um, license boom and a lot of money came in. And then the government took out a lot of debt, thinking that that whole mining boom was going to pay back all the debt right. through the revenue. And... Of course, you know, some of that capital, I don't, I'm not sure that capital that was raised by the government was invested very well, but even worse, the government started messing with all the mines and, and slowed, you know, the pathway to production. Right. And then they had a macro crisis. Right. Right. So it's like, if you're gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna take, you know, like let these things start getting productive, help, help things be as productive as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like someone got too sweet of a deal, you know, then you can put in a tax later. You know, uh, but but I think uh, meddling with things before they're fully developed and I think you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So it'd be good to see the government, you know, encouraging investment to come in, you know, letting it get productive and then talking if they felt like it was done wrong or whatever. Right. So I think that's really the key. But for me, it's I think local liquidity is is paramount. How you. Yeah. Yeah. Re developing real investor base. Mm. Okay. Uh, when you uh, talked about capital efficiency, uh, this instance came to my mind that uh, in 2015 or so, uh, there was a railroad being built, right? Mm -hmm. And the government, uh, I, I might be wrong here, but I think they invested about one trillion two bricks mm -hmm. that are nothing now because mm -hmm. it's not finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah capital efficiency and government spending mm. management um, had a lot of issues. Mm. But moving forward, uh, I think uh, government is uh, making policies that are uh, that are good for foreign investors. So, yeah. Okay, then um, I think I want to get into a bit more. Uh, well, actually, uh, let's say some company or founder of a company mm -hmm. is watching this interview right now sure. and they want to get uh, investment or seek financing uh, like Apple, APU, you know, mm -hmm. from foreign investors. Mm -hmm. What should they focus on? Yeah, okay, well, I think there's a small universe of investors that look at Mongolia, right? And I think a lot of this is, again, out of Mongolia's control. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, right now, if I take the current environment, you know, people are looking at the two neighbors and they're saying, you know, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. You know, so I think I think foreigners are are they're not going to be moving fast. OK, they're going to be thinking, OK, I need this guy up north to like cool his head, come back to <laughs> you know, like like settle down. And I need the guy down south to be not so scared of, you know, a flu. Right. So once that happens, um, I think people can start getting confident with the fuel supply coming from the north and the ability to move goods for cash to the south. And once you once that's in place, you know, I think foreigners mainly look at Mongolia for mining because that's where the big payouts are in terms of the big returns. I think it's also very risky, but you know, if you think about a foreign investor when we're when we're bringing money to Mongolia, our investors expect us to make over a 20% IRR in US dollar. So, you know, yeah, so, you know, you talk about, 
and that's the net of everything, right? So if you talk about taxes, you talk about costs to, to put everything on, you talk, and then FX, you know, so that, and, and then you take the size of the market. And, um, you know, that means the universe is quite restricted to where you can get that sort of return. You know, either you're timing an entry at a very bad time, like where it's a very bad time for assets, and you're getting some uplift from a cycle, and, um, you know, or you're investing in something that has a really skewed payout, and that's typically resources, right? Um, so I think the most important thing is to understand that you're competing for capital against all other countries in the world, right. and you're coming with a small market that hasn't been friendly to f investors in the past, um, typically doesn't like to see foreigners make money. <laughs> and, and um, you know, and with a lot of geopolitical noise going on and some serious macro challenges. So I would say right now, someone thinking they're going to get foreign capital, I think it's very difficult, you know, and the most, the biggest source of foreign capital is really development banks. And this is why I think in this environment, I think, as, as I said earlier, like renewable energy should be a focus because I think these development banks have a massive amount of capital for good renewable projects. And I think Mongolia should just be aggressive and tap that. Just take what you can get now, you know. Um, go for it. You don't need to rely on China to offtake that. You know, it's, it's going to create growth. It's bringing capital into the country when it needs it. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think that's, um, things like this, if you, if you're in the sustainability theme, I think you can attract capital, right? Um, I know there's, you know, some VC activity here and I think that's, you know, innovation is always great. And I think, you know, but again, for the foreign VC investors, I think they're always obsessed with TAM, you know, total addressable market, All right? That's like VCs are obsessed with this. So, um, Trying to explain a TAM, you know, on a population of, you know, just over 3 million people, it's challenging, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, the, sh the short answer is it's very difficult to bring capital here unless you sort of have all the pieces in place for that growth potential that we always talk about. And that means having logistics in place, macro stability, you know, your neighbors finding some new equilibrium. Hmm. Um, and then I think, you know, it's happened in the past. Foreigners get excited and they, they come here and they invest and it will happen again. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what mistakes do companies often make when seeking financing? Hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's, there's, I don't even know where to begin. You know, you have sometimes it's the wrong team. Sometimes you have a great individual that's doing too many things. Um, sometimes it's just the wrong idea, like doesn't make sense. Um, sometimes it's just half baked or, you know, there's fun, there's just fundamental flaws. Um, you know, common things you know, like people just want to see someone that's really like people have to be won over on the idea and the, per the person that's looking for the capital and simple as that. And um, <laughs> that doesn't mean it's simple to go through the process. It's like learning a language. How, if you want to raise capital, you have to learn the language to get the capital. And so it's, um, you need to know what the investor needs for returns. You need to know what they go through to get the capital to, to invest. Um, you need to get a feel for how are they really, or do they actually have the mandate to invest in Mongolia? Are they just sniffing? Um, you know, you, you sort of have to get through all these things. I mean, the other mistake people, like some, some people spend too much time with um, people that aren't serious. You know, it's like, so I don't know, there's, there's a lot to say, there's a lot of ways you can make a mistake. You can do a bad presentation, you have a spelling mistake, you're late to the meeting. Yeah, <laughs> it's right, like, it's, yeah. a, it's a laundry list of things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What does the future of development finance Asia look in regards to Mongolian market in the future? Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, personally, what I'm most excited about um, is really the carbon markets, which I was talking about before. And so personally, I think 
Mongolia has amazing natural assets. And I feel like, you know, Mongolia needs, right now Mongolia's brand is it's a giant mine. Mongolia needs to rebrand itself, you know, uh, as this amazing natural spot on the planet, which it is. And how, how are you going to shift that? And I, I think there's lots of ways. And I think carbon markets are creating that opportunity. Um, and I think people just need to see that nature can pay. <laughs> you know, if, if they can see a peat, uh, some peatland that's um, being conserved and there's a carbon credit program created out of that, that's creating a serious stream of income that can be given to all that local community to pres preserve that. Um, I think that's an amazing opportunity for Mongolia. And, and this is something that we're working on, you know, in Southeast Asia, like learning the carbon markets. And, you know, in the future, that's where I would like to really, you know, focus is on that theme in Mongolia as well. Mm, makes sense. Um, well, like, uh, let's take a um, break mm. and maybe move on to a different topic. Uh, sure. The one thing, one market I really want to get into mm. uh, is... Uh, blockchain slash cryptocurrency market of Mongolia. Because mm. uh, if you notice, Tom, last year, uh, we've, um, the cryptocurrency market raised about $200 million mm -hmm. in Mongolia alone. Yeah. And it was just, just a very surreal experience for me and mm -hmm. for our company because usually we just covered the traditional markets. But yeah. uh, this was just a very uh, interesting event mm -hmm. which happened worldwide but in Mongolia particularly mm -hmm. everybody was talking about it so uh, the hype has uh, slowed down now. <laughs> you could say that <laughs> yeah. yeah but there are still people uh, there are still many people and companies that are involved in this market mm -hmm. and continue to operate to this day and probably will, will in the future I don't know anyway what do you think about that market What's your current stance on cryptocurrency in general? Well, it's probably not the answer you want to hear, but I think it's been a giant Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Um, you know, the blockchain has some interesting attributes. You know, uh, ultimately, if you want to break it down to what it is, it's an append-only database technology. Uh, it just so happens in traditional append-only database technology, you know, you have administrators that have control over that or you know anything that needs to be appended it has to go through them in this case it's like a communal um, blockchain that's you know that's where the math and all the users you know sort of do that sort of appending and so i i don't find what like that actual that function of it there's nothing new about that now you know, all the cryptography and um, that aspect of it, I find very interesting. And I find the design of Bitcoin very eloquent. Um, but I don't believe it has a real utility. Um, so then do I think it's a store of value? I don't know. For me personally, I don't. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, it's un in, in many ways, it gets unfortunate how big it's gotten because I, it's polluting, it's... You know, the amount of brain power and power, you know, electricity power yeah. that's going to this thing <laughs> yeah. to me is sad in some ways. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of other important things that sh all these brains should be working on. And, um, you know, we're, the world doesn't need more pollution. Right. And I, I know all the arguments like, oh, that, you know, the existing financial system is polluting. But do we need two financial systems? Hmm. Um, and I think... You know, the other issue with it is, um, you know, I, I don't know, you can take some extreme examples, right? If, you know, your, your wife's ex-boyfriend puts on some revenge porn of your wife on the blockchain and you can never get it down. Like, who are you going to go to to get that down? Uh, yeah. Is, is that a good thing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, or, or if I talk about, you know, sustainable timber, you know, and um, people using it as um, trace, using blockchain for traceability, you still at some point have to link the the digital world with the physical world. And um, if I'm a bad actor, I know what I have to do is bribe the person that's tagging that timber as sustainable, for example. Because once it's on that blockchain, 
it's impossible to change. So to me, it's like a system that's great for bad guys, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of the use of it is, you know, I think a lot of the use has been, you know, uh, you know, moving money around, you know, the wrong ways, you know, don't get me wrong. I think some, in some cases, the banks needed pressure, let's say on like foreign exchange commissions, you know, I think there's some good things that have come out of it. Um, and I, you know, I think that can continue, but what it, what that industry became, um, you know, the amount of fraud and, uh, and, and again, it happened because there's for the, you know, there's no oversight and there's no one protecting the consumer. And that's why people loved it. That that's what was considered to be freedom. Um, but look, I mean, my credit cards have been hacked many times and one phone call and it's solved, you know, and I know these people with their wallets on the internet on the, you know, and granted they, they weren't using cold wallets. And so they're, you know, their electronic wallet gets hacked, you know, and these crypto people call them stupid. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's here for mass adoption. Um, I haven't, you know, I think there's some utility with, um, yeah, I think there's for things that are like what I'd call self liquidating, like a carbon credit. It's a good example, right? Um, something where you, you know, you, you have a smart contract around the, the carbon credit and then it expires later. I think something like that possibly, you know, there's a use case for it, um, but I would never see a good use case, let's say for like a fixed asset, like property, like breaking it down into, you know, blockchain ownership. Um, I, I think that's inferior to the way things work currently because you, you need people to promote things. You need people to take ownership of things. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I think, um, this is like a massive technology Frankenstein that was really created by the central banks uh, and some good technology. Don't get me wrong. I, I do think the technology, there's some great technology in there. Um, I just find it's gotten way out of control. <laughs> and I think what we've seen in the past week um, is there's, there was a lot of leverage and a lot of fraud. And this is all starting to, the, the house of cards is coming down now. Right. Um, and for the crypto world, this is 1929. This is the Great Depression. There's no central bank to bail anyone out. And 1929 became the Great Depression because there was no central bank. There were no central banks. The central banks were there, but they actually tightened. And that created the domino effect. Uh, 2008 could have been one of those events, but the central banks actually, you know, some people will argue they didn't save things, but, you know, they kept the economy moving. Um, and then you can argue it stayed too loose for too long, which created, you know, unintended consequences. But if, you know, if you were facing 1930s, you know, maybe that wasn't so bad. But crypto world doesn't have a choice. There's no one there to bail them out. And it's, um, yeah, I think it's going to be, it'll consolidate. I think there's enough of a following. It'll come back, but it's going to take a long time to consolidate. And, you know, I don't see much consensus as to who the winners are. You know, I think the there's a critical mass of users for or pe believers in Bitcoin. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of users of Ethereum. Um, the gas fees on these things, I don't. It's hard, and and the you know, <laughs> I think it's got a ways to go. Right. Um, but yeah, so so it's probably not. I know I know Mongolia is a big fan of crypto, so probably not what people wanted to hear. Um, but that's just my own personal view. Yeah. I can be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's very interesting to hear you speak very you have information and you have uh, knowledge about this market even though you say uh, you believe it to be uh, well not so so great mm -hmm. but uh, you obviously studied it so look I mean a digital uh, currency yeah. is definitely here to stay yeah I just think it's gonna be backed by central banks ah, right. so then what is yeah. the function of these things yeah right and then um, yeah, then you have uh, smart contracts, I understand, you know, uh, there, there's definitely going to be some uses for it. Um, but where it's gotten to, I think is, yeah, <laughs> it's gone for, overextended itself a long way. Yeah. 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 Uh, Tom, actually, I want to, mm, these are some of the closing questions sure. that I want to do. Uh, these closing questions are for uh, young people, young sure. people, uh, the young professionals. Uh, whether they're finance, finance professionals or just business professionals or just young people in general. Um, 
any advice for uh, people who are starting out? Not just in finance, but just sure. Um, yeah, look, I think. I, uh, well, I think number one, I think you have to be curious and read about a lot of different things and learn a lo- learn a lot about a different things. Um, not just finance. I think people make the mistake sometimes of just trying to get a CFA, you know. And I think um, you know the world's not moved by Excel spreadsheets, right? The world's moved by people with ideas that can convey those ideas and people that can understand and earn trust quickly from other people. Um, so I think it's really, I mean, you have to be curious. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, really spend time with people, you know, and uh, like network, you know, have a sense of humor, you know, life's long and difficult, you know, you have to enjoy it. And um, you have to get, you know, you have to have good relationships to get through and you have to be able to smile and laugh things off and um, think that's important. Uh, but I think um, probably in like the world of finance, you know, relationships are probably underestimated. I think it's it's really essential that you can build long term relationships with people and connect with them. Um, so don't neglect that aspect of it. Uh, of course, you have to be able to write well and communicate well and like do do math yeah, <laughs> these types yeah. of things right yeah, yeah but i think uh you know i think most important is just you know being curious and you know really taking interest in people and you know developing relationships right yeah the one um question i also want to ask tom uh, why do you do what you do like being a financier why well you know <laughs> every day is like a box of chocolates you know? <laughs> no it's um yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think um, you know different, different aspects. I mean, originally I didn't want to be in finance. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to be a, a war journalist, hmm. and um, I came out of school with a lot of debt because hmm. um, in the U.S. everyone has a lot of student loans. Right. So uh, for people who are watching this right now, uh, Tom actually has graduated out of Cornell. Yeah. I also studied at Oxford. Yeah. So yeah. it's very, it's a very. Uh, prestigious background, I would say, mm-hmm. and a very quality background. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so that, yeah. So, I guess I came out of Cornell and just had a lot of student loans, and uh, so I had I had to work. <laughs> so I, uh, I got a job in finance and to pay the bills, basically. And I thought I was going to go back to trying to become a war journalist, and then um, you know just became really interested in. Um, you know, finance. And that's why when you ask, what, what are we? Are we a fund? Yeah. yeah, I don't really, I don't really think about what we are. I sort of just do what's interesting, you know, and that means it can be, a, I really like an entrepreneur and I'll do, do whatever I can to, to help them. It can be, I see an opportunity and there's no entrepreneur in the space and then I'll try to find an entrepreneur and retool them. It can be someone that's just in a really bad situation. It can be something that's, you know, from a risk return standpoint, just looks great. And then, um, yeah, I just like, I like, I love learning about different people in different parts of the world. And, um, I find it fascinating, like talking to people and yeah. So, so, uh, this, I don't really, yeah, I, I, it just became interesting to me. And then, and then when you talk about being curious to do, to be good at this type of job or to do the job, um, you have to know a lot about a lot of things, right? So you have to know tax and politics and economics and business cycles and winning trust of people, handling people the right way, mentoring people, you know, so it's, um, it's nothing, it's never a dull moment. And if it is a dull moment, you're doing something wrong. You know? Yeah. That doesn't mean it's easy, (laughs) but yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any last remarks you would like to make for our Mongolian viewers? Yeah, look, I just say, uh, I'm always, and I know other uh, foreign investors are always impressed with the human capital of Mongolia. Um, I like to say it's the coldest market with the warmest people. Uh, so it's really nice. Uh, it's re- always nice coming here. Always, uh, the people keep me coming back. Um, I think, I don't think Mongolia has much to worry about from a human capital standpoint. Um, and yeah, I really hope the young people can keep pushing this country in the right direction. And I think that's, you know, renewable energy, uh, understanding 
what they need to do with their commodities, like getting the logistics efficient, productive, and then you know saving some some of those gains as in the form of sovereign wealth funds for future generations, and really maximizing out natural capital. Mm-hmm. You know, rebranding Mongolia from a mine to, you know, something to a natural wonder that can also pay. <laughs> you know, so. Um, yeah, and I think you know when uh, I think the key is just to just ask you know when when you're going about your business, you know make sure you're thinking about future generations when you're making your decisions. Mm. Okay, well that was a good one. Uh, right. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, uh, hopefully we will do one like this mm-hmm. in the future and Great. maybe reflect back on the journey that's to take place. Yeah, and. Uh, Yeah, thank you for being here. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there you go folks. So that was uh, Tom Holland, who is the co-founder and managing partner at uh, Development Finance Asia. Uh, I will link down uh, their information in the description below and maybe if you want to get in touch with them, uh, you can do so uh, through the description below. Uh, so see you next time and uh, subscribe to Lemon Press. See you next time.